Always. We ask the question. What is needed in the world? Utjecajni britanski historičar, autor više knjiga o historiji Bosne i Hercegovine, nekadašnji istraživač i svjedok stručnjak Haškog tribunala, Marko Atila Hoare za Al Jazeera govori o ulozi bosanskih muslimana u narodno-osovodilačkoj borbi, komunizmu, religiji i jugonostalgiji. So Marko, hello and welcome to the Al Jazeera Balkans channel. Thank you. Now, your book, Bosnian Muslims since the Second World War, has gained significant attention following its recent translation into the Bosnian language. Uh, why is the topic of Bosnian Muslims in World War II so understudied, yet so frequently alluded in almost daily conversations in Bosnia, but also in the, in the region? Yes, I, I think there's um, a number of factors there. I, I think that in the uh, Tito's period, there was um, a tendency to uh, conflate with different Yugoslavs, see everything as part of the Yugoslav whole. Um, so the interest, interest in nations is distinct from one another. What's spe specific about a particular nation, for example, the Bosniaks, wasn't really given attention to, and that was something which affected Western scholars as well. So, for example, a lot of Western scholars were bedazzled or uh, in love with the Titoist model of multinational coexistence, federalism, and that meant that they tended to downplay the distinctiveness of each of these peoples. So, see Serbs and Croats and Bosniaks, Slovenes, Macedonians, simply as equivalent parts of a greater Yugoslav whole. Mm -hmm. So what was distinct was ignored. Yeah. Now in your book you explore reasons for Bosnian Muslim opposition to the new order established by Nazis and fascists in Bosnia in 1941. Uh, how was this opposition manifested? Um, through a number of different factors. So um, the, Mo the Bosnian Muslims or Muslim Bosniaks uh, were for the overwhelming majority they were opposed to the incorporation in the independent state of Croatia, the Croatian fascist state. Uh, so they, they didn't want to be treated as Croats, they didn't want to be assimilated into the Croat nation, they didn't want Bosnia's uh, identity and autonomy as a country to be erased. So Are we talking about uh, Bosnian Muslim elites or the average Bosnian um, Muslim citizens? All of them, really. I mean, most of them didn't want th this. So the Ustashi, they uh, simply merged Bosnia into Croatia and erased all the Bosnia's borders. So there was that sense of um, alienation. And secondly, that the, the Ustasha regime was extremely brutal, um, not just particularly to Serbs and Jews, of course, but also to Bosniaks and Croats themselves. Uh, so it was a horrible state. It was brutal. It was corrupt. It was inefficient. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, they were threatening the Bosniaks with annihilation, not, not directly, but by provoking a sort of genocide, by carrying out a genocide against the Serbs, uh, they provoked Serb retaliation, which was largely inflicted against Muslims. Uh, which really threatened the Muslims, Muslim Bosniaks with catastrophe. So for all these reasons, there were, there were di different reasons for most Muslim Bosniaks to oppose this order. So it took a number of different shapes. So on the individual level, for example, in towns, you had um, um, officials who were in, in, you know, recruited into the Endeha or independent state of Croatia. Um, bureaucracy would shield, shelter Serbs and Jews and uh, dissidents against, against the regime. They would protect them where, where, where they could. Um, you had even home guard officers, cases of home guard officers, Muslim home guard officers who were recruited into the independent state of Croatia's armed forces who would protect Serbs from um, persecution or uh, Muslims would protect their Serb neighbours from, from persecution in the villages as well. Uh, so all, all these things happened. Um, there was more than organised manifestations of opposition. There were the famous Muslim resolutions right. uh, where members of the Muslim elite gathered together and issued resolutions condemning the Ustasha persecution of um, Serbs and, 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 and Jews in particular. Um, so that was these, these were some, some factors. Then it took a number of different forms. So we have to be clear that opposition to the Ustasha regime was what united most uh, Muslims, most, most politically conscious Muslims. Um, it didn't uh, necessarily mean opposition to fascism or Nazism in general. So you had, for example, uh, members of the Muslim elite uh, Ozelaga Haji Asanovic and others who appealed directly to the Germans to establish a protectorate over Bosnia that would t take Bosnia out of the framework of the independent state of Croatia. So they were not anti, they were certainly very far from being anti Nazi or anti fascist, but they were nevertheless anti Ustasha. Um, and then there were those Muslims who wanted to go into the Chetnik movement, to they, they, they um, joined the Chetniks in the hope that within the framework of the Chetnik movement, so nationalist movement, they could find some uh, protection for the Muslims of the people. I mean, you can say that in a sense. What united most of them, um, when it was above the individual level, was some desire to preserve the Muslims as a group and, and, and some degree of Bosnian autonomy uh, 
insofar as that was possible. Why did a large percentage of Bosniak Muslims support the communist movement? And was there a difference between rural and urban Bosniak Muslims in, in, in terms of numbers? Yes, yeah, so, so, so as I said, there were all these very strong reasons for the Muslims to join uh, some form of opposition. And ultimately, what the communists or the partisans, the people liberation movement was offering was perhaps the most attractive, because they were offering uh, at all times Bosnian autonomy. And then from uh, autumn of 1943, they were offering actual um, Bosnia as a constituent part of the um, new Yugoslavia. And eventually, in 1944, formally, they explicitly said, we, have, we support a Bosnian state. So this is obviously very attractive to the, to the Muslims generally. They were essentially, the communists were uh, promising to fulfill the national aspirations of the, the Bosnian Muslims, which had always been for some form of Bosnian autonomy um, and some form of recognition of the Muslims as distinct. Now that wasn't entirely respected in the end, but nevertheless, during the war, the communists would speak about equality of the three peoples, you know, Muslims, Serbs, and, and, and Croats uh, in Bosnia. There was also the catalyst, as I mentioned already, the. Um, uh, extermination of Muslims by Serb nationalist forces, by Chetniks, uh, genocidal persecution of, of the Bosniaks, uh, of the Bosnian Muslims, or Muslim Bosniaks. Um, and it became worse and sometimes more threatening even after the Italians capitulated. Itali the Italians had protected the Chetniks and after the Italians collapsed in the autumn of 1943, uh, the um, Germans began to edge towards collaboration with the Chetniks. And there were rumors that uh, Germany would turn over eastern Bosnia to Nedice Serbia, to the Quisling Serbia. And then the fear was that if you do that, then the Serb nationalist forces will gain control of the whole of eastern Bosnia and they'll carry out a genocide against the Muslims. So this was a great Serbian threat, which the Nazis were seen as being behind, complicit with. You know, Nedic visited Hitler um, to try and arrange this, and he didn't succeed, but nevertheless the visit incited uh, Muslim Bosniak fears. So would you say that the, the role of Bosniak Muslims uh, in the liberation of Yugoslavia from the Nazis and other fascist forces was pivotal? Um, yes, it was, it was very important because uh, the Muslims uh, comprised a very slight majority of the urban population of Bosnia at the start of the war, so about just over 50% of the population was Muslim. Um, and you can't take control of the country without taking control of the towns. And we've seen that in, in the recent war, uh, when the great Serbian forces and great Croatian forces also, they couldn't conquer towns like uh, Vukovar or like Sarajevo or Mostar without destroying them essentially without support from the, the local population there you can't you know it's very difficult to conquer towns against determined op opponents uh, if the partisans hadn't had support from Muslims they would have had uh, it has remained a forest army essentially like the Chetniks you know they could have taken control of the countryside in the mountains but to actually take control of the towns where power li lies they couldn't really have done that very very easily um, and it was really necessary to do this first to turn Bosnia into a base for the People's Liberation Movement, which could allow it to project the, co the revolution eastwards into Serbia. So essentially, uh, Croatia and Bosnia were party and bastions. Uh, Bosnia was actually where the, the partisan leadership was located for most of the war. So it was essential then to have this as a base to pr project the revolution uh, eastwards. We also don't know exactly how far Tito would have gone if he hadn't had this base support in Bosnia. So for example, uh, the first session of the Anti-Fascist Council of the People's Liberation of Yugoslavia, Avnoi, was held in, in Bihać in uh, November 1942, and that was where sort of the, the partisan leadership was constituted for the new Yugoslavia. And then a year later in Yaitse, also in, in Western Bosnia, um, the new Yugoslavia was formally uh, constituted. Um, so what would have happened if you hadn't had this uh, support among the Muslim population, perhaps Tito wouldn't have felt so emboldened to have done these crucial steps to establish this new Yugoslavia. We, we don't know what happened, but certainly it was very important to have this, this base. I mean, for example, um, to capture Bihać, this was dependent upon intelligence from sympathizers within the Home Guard Regiment I I in Bihać and from the local population of, of Muslims. Uh, that was important for helping the partisans to decide to take that town I in, in that way. Um, so it was essential at all, at all levels. Mm -hmm. Now, among some Serbian and Croatian nationalist circles, uh, Bosnian Muslim role during World War II is often reduced to and associated solely with uh, the, SS, the Nazi SS-13 division, the Hanjar division. Um, why is this the case? Why is, I mean, you're one of the few Western intellectuals who has paid due attention to the role of Bosnian Muslims in liberating the country from, uh, from the Nazis and, the f and their fascist allies. So it was very important for the um, genocidal goals of the great Serb nationalists in the recent war to demonize the Muslims to present them as having been pro-Nazi. So that was a major part of the uh, 
Serb nationalist mobilization to present the entire Muslim population in Bosnia as having been pro-Nazi or pro-fascist uh, and therefore to justify the need for a genocide in the 1990s and of course uh, Croat nationalists got on board with this as well so um, Islamophobia which Tudjman was very much read ready to, to promote to treat the Bosnian Muslims as alien, as kind of as uh, un-European, as, as, as evil in one sense or, or another. So it didn't pay for them to uh, in any way talk about the Muslims in any other role as, as, except as fascists. Um, unfortunately, too many Western journalists and historians were quite ready to accept these stereotypes. It was a sign of the superficiality of many Western scholars or, and journalists who approached this history. They tended to just believe it, take at face value these stereotypes. And of course they weren't just against uh, Bosniaks, but they were also against Croats, against Albanians as well. Um, these stereotypes put about by the Serb nationalists to demonize other, other groups. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there were far more players in Yugoslavia during World War II than the usual cast of characters with, with whom the average citizen is uh, fam familiar with. Uh, there were Muslims within the Ustashe movement, there were Muslims within the Chetik movement, as you mentioned. Uh, there were Muslims within the creation of the Home Guard. Uh, how do you make sense of all that? So the, the Muslims were uh, historically um, divided into different currents. So the most important current had tended to see themselves as a distinct group. Um, but there were attempts by Serb and Croat nationalists to co-opt the Muslims. And some Muslims went, went along with this. So you had, since the Habsburg period, you had pro-Serb Muslims and pro-Croat Muslims, those who identified with the Serb nation or the Croat nation. Um, so there's a dif difference in, in, in orientation. And then you had those who attended to be more, more religious and, 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 and more secular. Uh, or more conservative or more, or more liberal, so there were different currents anyway. Um, and then in, in the um, following the establishment of Yugoslavia in, uh, in 1918, you had um, the Muslims in a very weak position, so it was a question of which survival strategies you would pursue to, to survive. Um, and one group decided to pursue a kind of pro-Croat orientation to reject any, in the 1930s, to reject any collaboration with with um, the Yugoslav governments, Serb-dominated Yugoslav governments. And this group, the Muslim branch of the Croat Peasant Party, they then became the ones who supported the Ustashi. So they, this pro-Croat course in the 30s then laid the basis for their collaboration, or not just collaboration, but active participation I in the Ustasha movement. And that's, that was kind of their, their, their pre-war, something which their pre-war position uh, determined. Um, that was also related to the fact that some of them had lost land in the land reforms right. carried out by the Yugoslav Kingdom, and so they, they wanted to kind of compensate for that. Um, then, um, again, it was a question of the, the, the regime, the occupation regime, which was established uh, in the, um, 1941 after the fascists arrived, uh, being quite complicated and offering a lot of different uh, options. So you essentially had um, Bosnia being formerly part of the independent state of Croatia, but also uh, divided into German and Italian zones of occupation. Right. Um, and the Ustasha administration breaking down and the Chetniks taking over in some areas. So there were quite a lot of different options to pursue. And for the Muslims, you know, who were essentially facing a life and death situation, the threat of annihilation, um, it wasn't clear what the best strategy was. So you had, as I say, those who uh, joined the Chetniks, tried to sort of find salvation through the Chetniks. And that was also related to uh, pre-war pro-Serb currents in Herzegovina in particular, uh, which is quite a strong tradition of, of, of um, Serb nationalism among Muslims, some Muslims in Herzegovina. And um, others again sort of thought the best solution was to seek direct uh, administration from the Germans and others were quicker to identify with the, with the partisans. Um, there was also the question of the um, Muslims' own, own kind of um, uh, Mil autonomous military formations. But there were cases of uh, Chetik and Ustasha fighters uh, literally switching hats towards the end of World War II and joining the newly established, well, the, the, the dominant uh, communist partisan movement. Uh, why did communist partisans accept sometimes entire units of enemy combatants into their, uh, into their uh, ranks? Yeah. So this was very sensible politics because uh, those soldiers in collaborationist formations, um, for the most part, weren't hard, they weren't extreme committed Nazis or fascists. They were mostly people who had just been conscripted or who went along with it, um, part of a nation essentially. Um, so some of the, you know, it wasn't clear in, it, in the start of the war who was a part, which Serb was a partisan, which was a Chetnik, because the same individual could be wavering, could switch sides. So you wouldn't treat them all as enemies, you'd want to win them over. It was a political struggle. Uh, likewise, with the Home Guard, you know, there was, whether it was 200,000 of these soldiers who were mostly conscripts, most of them didn't have any identification with the Ustasha movement, 
um, they were part of a nation. You know, you would certainly wouldn't want to kill them all. If you try to kill them all, you turn the whole Croat and Muslim nations against you. So it was much cleverer to um, try and win them over, and it, it had effects. It meant that sympathetic elements among the home guards would surrender towns to the partisans. They wouldn't fight them. They wouldn't fight the partisans because they knew the partisans wouldn't hurt them if they won. They'd surrender. They'd give them the weapons. They'd be allowed to go home afterwards. Um, oh, they'd surrender towns to the partisans. So the partisans won the war largely through the strategy of co-opting formations. And of course, if you then draw them into your own troops, into your own army, the partisans, then you had them f fighting for you. And many good partisans had been Domobrans, Home Guards, or Chetniks, or even SS soldiers before. Mm -hmm. Now, how did communist revolutionaries, after defeating the Nazis and the fascists, uh, consolidate their power and turn into an authoritarian dictatorship? The revolution, although it was very, very much led by the Communist Party, that can't be denied. Nevertheless, it was a much broader movement. To win the war, the communists realized they couldn't wage a kind of purist communist struggle. They had to wage a kind of national liberation movement, which meant mobilizing a much broader movement than just their own party. So you had attempts to win over the Croat Peasant Party, for example, that was a, a one wing of that party then supported the partisans. You had some elements in Serbia, particularly those grouped around the League of Farmers, uh, Savez Zemiradnika, who were quite ready to collaborate. Um, and in, among the Muslims, again, it was, it was um, those who were ready to, to join who weren't communists. So some from the Yugoslav Muslim organization, uh, particularly those from this Gairet cultural organization, which is kind of a, a sort of Serbo-oriented cultural organization. So essentially what happens after Bosnia was partitioned between Serbia and Croatia in 1939, and that discredited pro-Serb politics among the Muslims, and so many of them then had, had no political home, and they became, returned to support the Bosnian autonomy, and many of them then joined the partisans later. Um, so the partisans had a strategy of building a broad movement with lots of non-communist elements, and that was crucial to their success. But once they won the war, they were now a weak regime at the head of this kind of pyramid of base, which was very uncertain. The number of commi committed communists was quite small. Um, so they were insecure, they were an insecure regime. And then they wanted to take them to the second stage. They didn't need any, any longer to be nice to these non-communist collaborators who'd fought alongside them. They could afford to be tougher with them. So straight away they then began, once they were secure in power, they then began to try and consolidate their, their regime by clamping down on all opponents. So particularly the Catholic Church, for example, was you know, targeted by the communist uh, regime, but also those who had been on their, on their own side. Mm -hmm. um, so they'd use these people to take power, and they didn't need them anymore, and then they began to um, exclude them from power increasingly. Including the Islamic community in Bosnia. Now, following the end of World War II, uh, Yugoslav communist, the Yugoslav go communist government enacted a number of laws that had deprived Yugoslav Muslims of their economic and religious autonomy, including uh, the abolishment of Sharia courts, mm -hmm. the nationalization of Islamic endowments, uh, the banning of the full face uh, veil known as the Zar and Fereja. Uh, did Yugoslav Muslims, especially those who had fought in the national liberation struggle, feel somewhat used or deceived by the newly established communist government? Yes, there were accounts of, of Muslim partisans who suddenly found that their dietary restrictions were no longer being respected, for example, uh, in, in when serving in the army. Or but they were respected during the war. Yeah, uh, exactly, and the, the mosques weren't being treated properly. They were being used, for example, to sort of store military stores. They weren't being yeah. respected. So the communists had been quite careful to respect Islamic sensibilities during the war, and they needed Muslim support. You know, there was pictures of sort of veiled women with long lived Comrade Tito banners, you know, these sort of things. Um, but then once they had won the war, they didn't really need to be so respectful, and then they began to, to sort of clamp down on, on, on Islam um, up to a point. I and mean, they did not that they attempted to suppress religion altogether, but they attempted to put it under their control and to kind of deprive it of autonomy and then precisely sort of forcible modernization in terms of banning Islamic dress uh, for women. So there were, you know, some Muslims did feel very much betrayed by this, essentially disappointed, mm. disillusioned. But how did Bosnian, Bosnian Muslim elites react to that? Uh, well, almost all the, those who had been um, the prominent non-communist collaborators of the partisans among the, the Muslim elite, one way or another clashed with the communists during and after the war. So some of them uh, really fell out with them. So Mohamed Sujaka, for example, had been one of the most important Muslim collaborators, and he, even before the war ended, was kind of fell into, dis fell into disfavor and was constantly then in trouble with, with the regime for many years afterwards, although he was never really, he wasn't killed or anything, but he was nevertheless um, essentially persecuted uh, by, 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 the, by the regime. Um, others, of course, the Muslim elite had been kind of, um, the ones which, the part which hadn't been behind the communists, hadn't collaborated with 
excluded from power anyway, so they were essentially smashed or di dispersed. Um, but you had um, a corresponding rise of support for the Mladi Muslimani, the Young Muslim Organization, which were kind of more radical Muslims, something related to the Muslim Brotherhood, and they had a more kind of like exclusivist, kind of separatist, almost like perspective of trying to build a something distinct Muslim politics, distinct non non-Muslims and they got more support after the war because as Muslims began to feel disillusioned with what how the communists were treating them, they then increasingly joined the young Muslims who then agitated for more Muslim rights and were then correspondingly persecuted. Mm -hmm. Like Ali Begovic himself was one of them. Right. Now many Bosnian Muslims today, especially the elderly, uh, still remember large-scale massacres by Chetnik forces, especially in eastern parts of the country. Uh, however, until Vladimir Dedier and uh, Anton Miletic's book was published in 1990, uh, those crimes were not really the subject of much, of much scholarly debate or, or study among uh, Yugoslav intellectual circles. Why is that so? It's a very good question, and I think we need, that needs to be investigated more to find a, a, clear, a clear answer. I think it was because, um, for the communists, the most important thing was to discredit the Chetniks in the eyes of the Serb population. So the Serb population obviously is the most important, the biggest, most important nation in Yugoslavia in terms of its size and power. Uh, so the important thing was to expose the Chetniks as collaborators, uh, as traitors to the Serb nation. So that was where the emphasis on the propaganda lay. So they perhaps weren't so interested in emphasizing this aspect of genocide again, against the Muslims. I mean, certainly if you look at the Titoist historiography produced in this period, there was certainly plenty of mention of, of killing of Muslims by Chetniks, and certainly the memoirs of leading communists like Rodolub Chulakovic record this persecution of Muslims. So it's not like they were trying to hide, hide it. It's just I, th I think that the propaganda they wanted to prioritize other aspects of Chetnik wrongdoing, so particularly the starting of civil war against, against other Serbs and the collaboration with, with the Nazis, betrayal of the Serb nation, um, which I think is, is a shame in a sense because if they had emphasized this genocidal aspect, perhaps the Serb consciousness would be a bit better in, 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 in understanding this genocidal tradition among great Serb nationalists, as it was the case with the Ustashi and the Croats. Now, the liberation of Sarajevo on April 6, 1945 is commemorated annually in the city. Uh, it is considered a major uh, event in the city's history, more important than the establishment of the city by Isabek Isakovic, the Ottoman government in the uh, 15th century. Uh, why, in your view, is Yugoslav communist heritage so present today among Bosnians? Well, I think it's un understandable. Essentially, the, 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 this revolution led by the communists you know, by, by the partisans, enacted by the partisans, established Bosnia as a state for the first time since the Middle Ages. So there had been no Bosnian state from the fall of medieval Bosnia in the 15th century up until the re-establishment re by, the, by the partisans. And that was what the, the, the uh, Bosnian Muslims, not just Bosnian Muslims, but other Bosnians as well, had, had wanted. I mean, there's a strong tradition among Serbs and Croats as well of support for auto autonomous Bosnia. And so essentially, although it wasn't a democracy, uh, Bosnia under communism did fulfill the national aspirations of, of all sections of the, of the population, um, particularly Muslims, also Serbs, and to a lesser extent, extent Croats. Um, and it was also a period of great prosperity and high quality of living, so probably the quality of life in Bosnia by the late Titoist regime, by the sort of 70s, for example, was an, and early 80s was perhaps as good as anywhere in the world almost. You know, some would say even better than a country like Britain. I mean, you know, you had um, quite a lot of personal freedom to travel and so forth. Um, you know, you're skiing in the morning and swimming in the, in the evening uh, on, on the sea. These, these stories people tell you, the high quality of life, it was excellent states, uh, welfare, you know, full employment, these things which people remember, can you compare it to what happened afterwards? Um, it seems like a, a lost um, golden age. Um, also, the Muslims were very much incorporated in the regime. So although we can say that perhaps all things considered, the Serbs were the strongest overall within that regime and, and perhaps the Croats were second, nevertheless, Bosnian Muslims were um, very much part of that Yugoslav regime, so it wasn't like they were a subject people, they were, they were part of the Yugoslav um, regime at, 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 all, at all levels. And perhaps they identified it with more, more than others did, so we know that the Serb nationalists ultimately rebelled against Yugoslavia and destroyed it under Milosevic, and the Croat nationalists, of course, also tended to sort of want, and there was all these separatist ten ten tendencies there as well, and the Slovenes too. But for really, among all, all Yugoslavs, except perhaps the Macedonians and Montenegrins, the Muslims were really those who believed in Yugoslavia and it suited them, and, and quite rightly so. And since what happened after Yugoslavia collapsed it was a disaster for, for the Bosniak Muslims, Muslim Bosniaks. Now in recent years there has been a lot of uh, historical, historical revisionism in Bosnia, but also in neighboring Serbia and Croatia. Uh, World War II era uh, Nazi collaborators are being lionized. Mm -hmm. um, how is this related to the rising right-wing sentiment in Europe? I think it, it is related. So at one level, the, um, 
what was happening first among Croats and then among first among Serbs and then amongst Croats in the 80s and 90s, just kind of uh, Islamophobia um, on one hand and kind of rehabilitation Nazi collaborators. Um, that was, was kind of an int intrinsic part of this genocidal project which was inflicted upon the um, Bosnian Muslims in the, in the 90s. So that was kind of a, um, something which in which um, there was at that time no apparent equivalent in, in the rest of democratic Europe. But nevertheless, we've come, come back to that afterwards and essentially the rest of the, the world has unfortunately caught up. So it's Islamophobia that was very important f um, for the Serb nationalist and Croat nationalist projects in Bosnia has now been taken over by um, the far right um, in Western Europe as well and even in countries like uh, Hungary and places where there aren't really that many Muslims. Mm -hmm. um, so, and this rise of the far right then has involved other things that so in some countries attempt to downplay Nazi collaboration, we even support, it depends, what, depends on the country. Um, it looks, takes a different shape, a different form in each country, but a country like Italy where the fascist tradition was strong and it wasn't properly denazified after the war. There's a lot of identification with fascists in Poland, perhaps not so much, but nevertheless an unwillingness to confront Polish anti-Semitism. So this sort of rise of the far right has legitimized um, the rehabilitation of Nazis and fascists and, and, and collaborators. So then, and what happens among Serbs and Croats then is very much part of that, of that general trend. Right, Marco, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Always. We ask the question. What is the world?